Chapter 19. On September 10, 1608, Captain John Smith takes the oath of office and becomes our new president. He officially decrees that he will he that will not work shall not eat, and he holds us to it. Gentlemen or not, any man who wants supper has to pitch in. But even with this decree, he is well liked. Unlike presidents Wingfield and Ratliff before him, Captain Smith divides the rations equally with us and works right alongside us sharing the burdens too, and he stays in the cabin as he always has shared with Reverend Hunt. John Layden and others, there will be no mansion in the woods for President Smith. There are a few gentlemen left from our group who try and run off on the discovery with our food, and I sometimes hear grumbling from them, but they are far outnumbered now by men, new settlers or old, who have great respect and trust for Captain Smith. So now I am the page of a ruler. It is the most important I have ever felt in my life. I wish my mom could know, and I hope she does know, taking a peek down from heaven now and then. She would also be very surprised to see that a commoner is our president. I think it would make her happy to know we were here in the new world. The gentlemen don't hold all the power. Captain Smith continues to write our story. He has also drawings of maps and the rivers and land he has found on his exploration trips. I am relieved to find out that not all of his writings were destroyed in the fire. Some of the pages had already been sent back to England when Captain Newport. One day in late September, Richard and I are in the field harvesting vegetables. We have grown them in the way that Namatuck taught us, planting the corns and beans together in a mound so that beans plants can climb the corn stalks. Suddenly we hear shouts from the river front, ship ashore! A few minutes later, she flies the British flag. Richard and I stop working and look at each other. Could it be Captain Newport so soon, Richard asks. I look at the baskets of beans and squash we've already gathered. I hope we've done enough work to earn our supper, and that no one will mind if we go to greet the ship. Let's go see, I say. Other men come to the riverfront as well. We watch as the ship glides towards shore, and Captain Newport is at the helm. Another crowd of colonists to feed, no doubt, Henry grumbles. Let's hope they've sent us more skilled workers and fewer gentlemen, as I requested, said President Smith. The ship anchors and a long boat is lowered, and the first few passengers begin to climb down the rope ladder. The late afternoon sun glints in my eyes, and at first I think of what I'm seeing as a trick of light. But then I hear the men around me as amazed as I am. Could it be? My lord, it's a vision. How could they send women to this godforsaken place? As the long boats near us, men trip over one another, rushing to help. Let me give her a hand. No, let me give her a hand. I'm surprised we don't have a fist fight before the longboat even lands. In the boat are a number of men, but all of us see who the two women are, sitting straight-backed, clutching satchels. One of the women is older and large, with a round face and a double chin. The other woman, a girl really, has pale skin and dark, frightened eyes. A few black curls peek out from under her coif. I listen to the conversation as the longbow passengers are introduced to President Smith, Ma Master Francis West, Master Daniel Tucker, Master and Mrs. Thomas Forrest, and Mrs. Forrest's servant girl, Anne Burris. It has been a long time since we have seen English women. It gives me a twinge of sadness of missing my mother to see their colorful petticoats, indigo blue and saffron yellow with white coifs. It feels familiar like home. Miss Ann Burris squints her eyes, scowls, and ignores the men who are jostling one another to have a chance to carry her satchel. She holds tight to that satchel and turns her back to them. I feel sorry for her being the center of attention like that when she obviously doesn't want to be. Namatak is on the next longboat trip to shore. I am surprised to see that he is wearing a linen shirt, but England does not change him that much. His hair is still shaved close on one side and long on the other, and his eyes are still bright. He beams at me. Hello, Samuel, how are you? He calls out in accented English. I am new. I'm a new world traveler. I laugh. You're speaking English my well, my friend. I called to him and realized that in his few months away, with no one to speak Algonquin with, he has plenty of time to learn the English language, much more than the few words and phrases Reverend Hunt taught him before he left. Namatak, where is your stick? I ask, did you make lots of notches in it? Namatak shakes his head. Too many people, he says. I throw stick and river. Reverend Hunt is very happy that Namatak is now speaking English so well. He wastes no time but sits him down to tell him about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how he must bring the message of salvation to other Powhatans. Namatak nods enthusiastically. Yes, yes, I learn of your gods in England, and I tell them of my gods. He launches into a lively description of Okeas, the ret with a vengeful god who requires sacrifice of tobacco, copper, beads, and sometimes animal blood, and sends punishment if he is not made happy. He tells us about Aphon, the god who is all loving, all forgiving, and makes the sun shine and ripens the crops. And he tells us of the great respect his people have for the spirit of life that is in all things, people, animals, plants, fire, wind, water. Reverend Hunt shakes his head. No, no, there is only 
one God, maker of heaven and earth. River uh, Reverend Hunt tells the story of creation, how God made the world and all things in it in six days and rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Again, Namatak nods with interest. Oh, oh, now I tell you of how our world was made, he said. He tells us a story about the great hare, rabbit, who creates different kinds of men and women and puts them in a big sack. He protects protected them from giants who wanted to eat them. The great hare filled the rivers with fish and put deer upon the land. Then he took the men and women out of the sack and put them in different places on earth. I enjoy Namatak's story, but I can see that Reverend Hunt is becoming discouraged. Namatak does not understand that he has to give up his gods and stories and take the word of God from the Bible back to his people. Reverend Hunt begins to explain again, but Captain Smith finds us boys sitting idle and tells Reverend Hunt he needs to come work. In the gardens. I put on my straw hat, pick up a basket. I hope Reverend Hunt is not too disappointed that his first time trying to convert a, convert a Virginia native to Christianity did not work out. Captain Newport has brought us 70 new colonists, stores, and news that the rocks we sent to England were, once again, just rocks. The Virginia Company has a new idea about how we can make a profit. We could use raw materials we have here in Virginia to make pitching, to make glass, pitch, tar, and soap ashes to send back to England. They've sent us several Polish and German tradesmen to get us started with these projects. They've already begun to build a glass house a little way from our fort with a large furnace for glass making. Captain Newport has also brought orders from Virginia Company to place an English crown on Chief Powhatan's head, making him a prince under King James, and making all of his people English subjects. My mind reels when I hear this. Chief Powhatan thinks we are his subjects, and now he they want to make Powhatan's people English subjects? Oh, the whole thing tangles my brain in knots. If the thought of being Chief Powhatan's subjects would be distasteful to the gentlemen, then I imagine that becoming subjects of King James would be just as distasteful to the Powhatan people. Especially after they hear Namatak's report on King James, well, whom he met while he was in London. Our chief Powhatan is much better than your king, Namatak says, speaking Algonquin so that our gentlemen will not hear his assault of our exalted king. Your king is short, a weak man. Our chief is tall and very strong. Your king has no hair and no teeth, just a round belly from eating too much. How can such a man be a king? The look of disgust crossed Namatak's face as if he's not quite sure how to tell me his next point. And... He stinks. Does he not bathe? He drinks wine until he can no longer stand or speak. I have heard these stories about our King James. It is well known that the king's doctors have warned him that bathing caused this the plague, and he has taken his advice to heart. He almost never bathes. Ew. Yet Englishmen still honor him. He is, after all, our king. Namatak feels no such obligation. The natives bathe quite often, even in cold weather. Weather. They have no fear of the English plague, only disdain for English stink. Our chief Powhatan is a true king, says Namatak. He is powerful and honorable. I'm about to have my first chance to meet the great chief Powhatan. Captain Smith is taking me and Namatak, along with three other men, over land to wear a Wokomo. We will bring in an invitation to chief Powhatan to come to Jamestown to receive gifts from King James and to be crowned. Captain Smith is angry at the whole plan. Very angry. Make an emperor into a prince? Ask an emperor to travel to receive gifts? I assure you this will not sit well with chief Powhatan, he said. He is king here in his own country. What right does King James have from across the ocean to make him his subject? Power is like weights and balance. No one gains power without someone else losing power, and Chief Powhatan does not want to lose any of his power. It has been a long, hard, cold road to peace with Chief Powhatan, but if he understands what this coronation means, it well may well be the end of our peace. Captain Newport refuses to budge. He is bound to carry out the orders from the Virginia Company, and so Captain Smith prepares our journey to where Wokomo. In the meantime, Miss Ann Burris is making quite an impression at Jamestown. She's almost always busy taking care of Miss Forrest, a very plump gentlewoman who hasn't figured out that life in Jamestown will be a lot harder than England. She's constantly making demands on Ann. Heat some water, wash these clothes, get supper on the table. Miss Forrest insists that having her meals in her cabin with her husband instead of eating it from the communal cook pot with the rest of us. During the rare romance, Anne is not busy. She is every unmarried man in the colony trying to get her attention. Even Nathaniel, who's 16 by now, makes a fool of himself strutting around in his armor, making a show of his musket and sword. There are at least two or three fistfights a day, and I have no doubt they are because of Miss Anne Burris. She's only 14, so she's of marriageable age, and I expect we'll have a wedding before too long. One day, Namata Richard Namatak and I are sent to repair the fish nuts and fish nets and bring back the catch for supper. We're the only ones at the riverfront when Anne comes down to fill the buckets with water. Here, we can fill them, Richard offers. We're almost barefoot and wet. He takes the buckets from her. Anne doesn't smile or say thank you. She just looks away as if she's afraid to look anyone in the eye for fear they'll try to court her. We're just boys, I want to say. We'll just be your friends. 
While we, are, we, while we fill the buckets, Anne walks to somewhere where wildflowers are growing and picks a small bouquet of yellow, purple, and white. Then it seems as if my unspoken message has somehow gotten to, through to her because she comes and sits down. A moment of peace, she says, and rubs her sore shoulders. Your mistress works you hard, I say. I don't add what I've been thinking for weeks. You never live through the winter if you stay so skinny and tired. But I don't ask what I've been suspicious about. Is your mistress eating some of your food rations? And shrugs. No harder than I worked in England, she says, but I know this can't be true. President Smith says if we don't work, we don't eat, says Richard. I don't see your mistress doing much work, but by the looks of it, she does a whole lot of eating. Richard Namatak and I laugh, but Anne scowls. Don't insult my mistress, she scowls, but we can't help ourselves, and soon she breaks down and laughs with us. When we settle, Anne says, Mistress For Forrest makes me work every moment because she's afraid I'll find a, a beau. She blushes. Her husband says I should marry, but he wants to keep me as her maid. You have found this bow, this man, Namatak asks, and shakes her head. She's found about 400 of them, Richard exclaims, and they all start laughing. Finally, Anne says, I better get back or I'll get, beat, I'll get a beating for dawdling. She says, we'll help her balance the yoke across her soldier, so, shoulders and lift the buckets of water. As I watch her back to the floor, walk her, as I watch her walk back to the fort, I think that Mrs. Forrest should be made to do some of her own chores, and that Anne's best chance of making it through the winter will be to get away from that demanding woman. When she's gone, Richard asks, who do you think she'll marry if she gets permission? Maybe your wear ones, Captain Smith? Namatok suggests. I shake my head. He's the only unmarried man not trying to court her. He must be too busy for marriage. As we repair the fishnets, we have fun guessing who Miss Ann Burris will pick if she gets permission to get married. I only hope she finds someone who will be kind to her and make sure she gets her full food rations. I have never dug a grave for a girl before, and I don't want to start now.